in certain tradition, it's not a tower at which the languages of the world are created. It's actually a cosmic tree. And the thing for us, you know, living in, in the modern West, those don't seem to have any kind of relationship until you realize that in the scriptures and in traditional cultures, a tower is a ladder to heaven. It links together heaven and earth. And the notion of a cosmic tree is one of the most common symbols you find from around the world. So it's very easy when you understand the way in which these concepts are linked with each other in the Bible and in the ancient world to see how these transfers get made. everyone this is seraphim hamilton and today after several months we are back with ken griffith to do our long-awaited episode on euhemerism uh, which is a way of looking at traditions from the near east and the broader ancient world to reconstruct what happened after the flood so ken welcome back thank you seraphim it's really great to be back so tell us a little bit about what uh, euhemerism is and uh, tell us who euhemerus was. Okay. Yeah. So uh, euhemerus was a, a Greek, I don't know if you'd call him a historian or more of a philosopher, who wrote in the fourth century BC, he wrote a sacred history and he is credited with the proposition that the gods were merely deified men. In other words, the Greek gods were just ancestors. And um, euhemerism is, generally speaking, uh, the historical interpretation of mythology, saying that the Greek myths, the Sumerian myths, of, of or any particular culture, that some percentage, some portion of those myths are based on the actual deeds of ancestors. Um, obviously, every body of mythology from any culture is going to have explanatory myths as well and maybe astrological myths thrown in so it's not an absolute claim that all mythology is history it's simply a claim that um, some mythology is based on history and that therefore the study of mythology could be somewhat illuminating to certain parts of history and uh, my particular take on this is that um, we can illuminate a lot of the history between the flood and the dispersion from Babel because I believe um, effectively the kingdom at Babel was the golden age that the Greeks and other cultures glorified into their pantheons. So the Greeks and, and other cultures, they have a system for dividing the ages of the world. And if I remember correctly, it you know begins with the golden age and there's a gradual decline down to the present. So you're saying that when they remember the golden age, what they're actually remembering is this corporate rebellion against God, which is described in Genesis 11. Yes. And also the t it was the time between the flood and Babel before the first generation of patriarchs after the flood started to die. So it was a time of no sickness, a time of no death. I mean, obviously there was someone probably fell off the tower of Babylon and died but the point is that generally um they it, life seemed to be pretty good to them at the time and then the things they suffered later seemed a lot harder to oh the good old days and it kind of turned into um uh, really a theology so yeah you know it's a remarkable thing that very often uh people want to cut off Genesis 12 and following from the chapters which preceded. But what we find in Genesis 12 and following is a gradual decline towards present rates of aging and death. Abraham dies at 205 years old. And of course, the first generations after the flood, uh, up to about the uh, event of the Tower of Babel itself, are living to nearly five centuries. So what is the, the um, tradition of uh, euhemerist thought how does this tradition come into the christian church as a way of interpreting the mythological traditions of nations uh, it was actually popular amongst a number of the early church fathers specifically eusebius but even a few others too um, in there they were basically debating the greeks and the roman and greek pagan uh, religions and interpreting the pagan religions as 
history that had been basically they were deifying ancestors was actually rhetorically a very powerful way of debating uh, paganism. Um, so that's kind of how it got introduced into the church. Uh, in the 19th century, you had this blooming of interest in history, a classical history, and it was just as we started digging up the ancient Near East and we hadn't learned how to translate tablets yet. And so you had a lot of scholars just mastering Greek and really digging into the Greek histories. And so um, there was this, I guess you would call it a second bloom of euhemerism in the 19th century. Um, there, unfortunately, toward the end of the 19th century, there was a guy named Alexander Hislop, and he published a book which took euhemerism and mixed it, turned it into a screed against the historical liturgy of the church. So he kind of used euhemerist interpretation as a weapon against what he perceived as what's wrong with the church. And I think that resulted in um, a rejection of hemer euhemerism in scholarly circles in the 20th century, probably largely due to the fact that there is a large Roman Catholic um, influence and um, maybe majority in his basically history departments at universities around the world. And I'm not saying that as any kind of a conspiracy. I'm just saying that it was a natural reaction to a bad argument. Um, but I think that that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So if we go back and just look at the original texts and analyze it in terms of comparison with the Bible and other uh, sources of known history, we might find that um, euhemerism can actually shine some light on the early chapters of Genesis. Yeah, you know, as you say that, I, I remember a couple of things. You know, first of all, remember those Jack Chick tracks where they talk <laughs> about the religion of Babylon and use it to explain the origins of Roman Catholicism. I think that's kind of what you're referring to with Alexander Hislop's stuff. <laughs> um, but but then on a on a more serious level, one of the interesting things that strikes me when you read Genesis and you compare it with uh, the tablets that we've dug up from the Near East and elsewhere is, you know, Genesis 1 to 11 in particular has uh, these two uh, large relative to the content in which they're found, genealogies, just as you find in the major uh, epics from the Near East and elsewhere, that there's often a genealogy of the gods, which defines the early history of mankind. So, if you take that paradigm of looking at Genesis and these mythological traditions as corrupted versions of an authentic history, what does the human story look like from the flood to the time of Abraham? Okay. Um, I'm going to read from my notes over here, even though I've got a slide up that's a little bit ahead of where I am. Um, so Genesis gives us a skeletal outline that you had the flood, sacrifice, blessing, and kingship. Uh, you know, Noah gets off the ark. He sacrifices. He's blessed. And in addition to the, the pre-flood blessing of Adam, he's also given kingship and also meat to eat. Um, then we have trouble in the family. There's this um, thing that happens with Ham and Canaan being alienated from Noah by doing something involving uh, nakedness. And then you have... Um, and basically the, the Babel rebellion. Um, and then you have a uh, Nimrod who's a new Cain and he's mighty against Yahweh. Uh, and that's just mentioned kind of as a side note in Genesis 10. It's, it doesn't give us a whole chapter on him. It's just a note that he was mighty against Yahweh. Um, we have the evidence in the lifespans just in Genesis 11, uh, 11 that the lifespans are rapidly reducing because it gives us 10 generations and how long they lived. Uh, and then we have uh, Abram born, and if we use the chronology of Usher, uh, two years after Noah dies. So uh, Abram is kind of the new hope, um, if Genesis was a Star Wars movie. <laughs> uh, so what we have is a very skeletal outline of a period of about 350 years. And the divine author of Genesis had good reason to leave certain things out. He's concealing the nakedness, not just of Noah, but also of his wife and Ham too. But we've reached a point in history where understanding the backstory may help us to avoid repeating the sins that brought the flood in the first place. Um, you hemorrhism can allow us to learn the backstory of what happened, in my opinion. 
by filling in the missing details. Um, however, the results are disturbing and dark. So uh, when we go about um, this process of sorting through these traditions, which seem to be quite uh, fantastic, obviously they're mythological, how precisely do we look into these sources and get to a historical core? So I have three basic things, three basic rules that I use, which is really simple, but it seems to be reasonably effective. Um, the first one is I, I look for mythological characters who did something recognizable in the scriptural narrative that's kind of unique. Now, an example would be the, humili the humiliation of Noah, where Noah lays down to sleep. Somehow his nakedness gets exposed by Ham. Um, when he wakes up, he curses. There's there's a curse uttered that involved uh, the son of Ham. So Ham has a son who gets cursed. And we find the same pattern in a number of the mythologies that we'll look at in a minute. Um, the second thing is to look for two or three witnesses among the pagan um, narratives to support any particular fact. So we might have six or eight different pagan mythologies that we're looking at. If three or four of them agree on one particular element, then that element has a pretty high chance of being true. That's two or three witnesses establish anything, uh, establish a fact, right? Um, and the third rule that I have for myself is uh, pagan sources are not allowed to contradict scripture. So that that's kind of my reality check. Um, so we're dealing with mythology. There's a lot of embellishment. Um, there's obviously a false theology. So we're looking in, we know it to be a corrupt source, but we're wondering is, are there any kernels of truth that were preserved in this source? Um, because ultimately Satan always has to use a kernel of truth to make a good lie. So um, that's also why we should be cautious uh, when trying to do euhemerism, if you want to call it that, is that we are, we are dealing with corrupt sources. We're dealing with corrupt theology uh, and we're trying to find some truth by looking for where two or three agree. And they also agree with something that says that the Bible says. So there are a lot of potential uh, pitfalls that could happen, but that's the basic method. So up on your screen here, um, you have a chain of what you've called God Kings that are found in Hellenistic era sources whom you call the ancient chroniclers, which we've discussed in our series on a revised chronology. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about what uh, the viewers are seeing on screen, how you get this list? Yes. So, um, there's actually, I guess this list has two components. Number three through six are a list of kings that come from Tessius and other Greek sources. Um, the kings, the first kings after the flood in Assyria. So you've got Belus, Ninus, Semiramis, who was the wife of Ninus, and Ninia Zemes. Um, number one and two are... The, their their ancestors which are found by kind of grafting that list together with the greek pantheons and so each line in this list you've got names usually with the greek one on the left side and then the babylonian or whatever other cultures are involved and on the far right i have um the bible character so line one anu is the name uh we find noah's the root of his hebrew name is just nu New, and you find that root in almost all of the um, the Noah god names in the, the pagan pantheon. So Anu, Janus, the that was the Roman god, Oranos, the Greek, uh, Oanus and Anis are Babylonian. Uh, Gyges means grandfather in the Anatolian languages, and I could have added Vishnu and further. Uh, there's there's more of those. Noah has a lot of names in a lot of languages, but usually there's a new an nu root in there. And in, in um, some of these names, uh, the word is actually then derived from the word for heaven in the actual meaning of these languages. Could you just clarify how exactly the name gets associated with the idea of heaven? In these mythologies, and the, the Greeks and the uh, Sumerians both had the same, they did the same thing, which suggests it happened very soon after the flood or after the dispersion. 
they deified Noah as the God of heaven or heaven itself, Anu, and they deified his wife as the mother goddess, either Gi, Gaia, um, uh, what's the other one? Yeah, various mother goddesses, but Gi and Gaia are obviously the Greek ones. Um, and we're going to get to Namu. Nam, so Naamu is a name that's preserved in the Sumerian, and she also is called the mother of all the gods. So there's a connection between her and the mother goddesses. So heaven and earth, um, if you think about male and female, um, the earth is often perceived as feminine. Uh, and it, you know, The farmer plows the earth, plants the seed, and it grows into fruit. Um, and even the Bible uses that as a metaphor for human sexuality many times. So it's and not actually Adam, surprising. Yeah. Adam himself is described in Genesis 2 as the generations of the heavens and the earth, with the heavens being the spirit of life, the breath of life, and the earth being, of course, the dust of the ground. Um, I have an old article on, on my substack called uh, The Bible is the True Theogony um, in light of this, because it will later describe in Genesis 14 the Lord as the one who is the possessor, but it could also be rendered the begetter of heaven and earth. So I think it's an interesting maybe research question here, the exact relationship of the deified Noah, if your argument is correct, to the worship of the actual uh, God of heaven. But go on. Well, and arguably Noah was the high priest of the God of heaven uh, immediately after the flood. And some of the myth myths that we see, um, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh, he calls whoever he went up there to kill, he calls him Huawa, which appears to be based on Jehovah. And the Chinese called Noah Yao. Um, it's possible that they, the priest of Yao, Yehovah Yahweh, um, ended up becoming Yao, called Yahweh by later generations. Um, I'm not saying that, obviously, uh, Noah was not Yahweh. He was not an avatar, but he was a man in whom the spirit of God was, and he was a priest of Yahweh. Yeah, it's, it's easy to see sometimes, I think, how these associations and mistakes get made. One of the things which um, kind of interests me is that when you look around the world at traditions which seem to correspond to the Tower of Babel, um, you know, in certain traditions, it's not a tower at which the languages of the world are created. It's actually a cosmic tree. And the thing for us, you know, living in, in the modern West, those don't seem to have any kind of relationship until you realize that in the scriptures and in traditional cultures, a tower is a ladder to heaven. It links together heaven and earth. And the notion of a cosmic tree is one of the most common symbols you find from around the world. So it's very easy when you understand the way in which these concepts are linked with each other in the Bible and in the ancient world to see how these transfers get made. And so I think that's a useful way of looking at uh, the interpretation of these early mythologies, that they're wrong, but they're also wrong in a way which conceals just a hint of truth or you can understand how they made that error. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also uh, a sacred mountain is a sacred mountain is also a form of the tower and the tree, right? And the ladder. Yeah. But also yeah. a woman um, has a sacred mound too. So uh, all that stuff, you can just see how sexuality, heaven and earth, there is a spiritual way in which it's all tied together, but it's tied together through Christ, uh, the bride, the bridegroom, the bride and the bridegroom. Um, so anyway, let's, I will leave that to guys like you who are really good at it. Um, what we find in the, uh, in these theogenies, and this is just from the Greek, this is just from the Greek sources alone, but we find the same thing in the Sumerian. You have a set of the old gods, also called the Titans, and they get overthrown by the younger gods. And this is the story of the Tower of Babel. So the old gods, um, Oranos, but also called Gyges, and uh, Gyges comes from the Anatolian Cucus, which means grandfather. Uh, and there was, obviously was a later figure in history called G uh, King Gyges, but whose name also means the same. It means grandfather. Um, and the three sons, Titan, Iapetus, and Kronos. Um, Iapetus is identifiable by his name. It's very, pretty obviously Japheth. Uh, Titan is this great, strong enemy leader of the um, the three Titans, the sons of Gyges. 
And Kronos is identifiable as Ham by his behavior. Um, so we kind of end up with Titan as Shem as he's the one that's left out. Of course, the Greeks later added more to these. There's Oceanus. They basically added a lot of kind of um, conceptual Titans to the three main ones who appear to be based on people. They also said that after the Tower of Babel fell, um, Kronos had a war with Titan. And that we will get into that was... Um, basically the war between Nimrod and Shem after the Tower of Babel. Um, so the younger gods, you have Zeus in the Greek pantheon. He's also called Picos and um, Poseidon, Hades, and Heracles. And the argument is not merely etymological. The argument is where they are in the birth order. And also you can connect them um, in the various pantheons as basically the same set of actions. So it appears that Cush was the leader of the Tower of Babel, and his two lieutenants were basically his cousin, or sorry, his nephews, Sidon and Heth, who were the uh, sons of Canaan, his little brother. Um, and Heracles ends up being the, the hero who's the muscle, who enforces the Olympian order, right? And so for the Greeks, Mount Olympus, the sacred mountain, is when the younger gods overthrew the old gods and established the new order. And that is their version of the story of Babel. Um, and I don't know if you want to ask me the question or I could just roll into the identification of the, hum the humiliation of Noah as one of the key ways to identify this. Uh, no, I, I can introduce it. Okay. Um, is this, this picture is of Ham's revolt, is it? That is a picture. That's a Greek Oh, okay. painting. that's Oranos being castrated by Kronos. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, okay. So Genesis 9 uh, describes this strange event that you've mentioned already earlier, uh, where a Ham exposes his father's nakedness, but a Yafeth and Shem cover over the nakedness of their father. Um, on the screen here, the viewer can see an image of an event from Hellenistic mythology. What is Ham's Revolt of Noah? And what does it have to do with the images that you see on the screen? And what are the witnesses which clarify the nature of this event from the ancient world? So I would call it the humiliation of Noah that's recorded in scripture. And we have many sources that refer to this. So from Hesiod, we have Kronos castrated Oranos. Um, Hesiod was the, the Greek poet who wrote the Theogony. Um, Sankoniathon was a, or whose name I pr probably mispronounced. Um, he was a Phoenician historian from the 12th century uh, BC who was translated by Philo of Byblos. And according to him, he... Philo translated the names into the Greek names. So again, you have a second witness of Kronos castrated Oranos. Thallus says that Gyges, who that's the name for grandfather Noah, was smitten and fled to Tartarus. So the smiting probably refers to the castration or whatever the castration re is referring to. In the Hittite myth, you have these this list of the, of the kings of heaven. And Anu, Noah, is overthrown by his son, Kum Arbus, whose name Kum is identifiable as Ham, who bites him in the knees, which um, as if you read the entire <laughs> episode, it's pretty clear it means he castrated him. Um, and he also gets cursed. Uh, so in that story, um, Anu then curses him to be overthrown by his son. So there's a, a very similar curse to the curse on Canaan. Um, in Egypt, you have Amun, who separated Naunet from her husband Nu, and he became the bull of his own mother. So the meaning he married his own mother, but the Egyptians took that further and then declared that Amun basically was self-created because he was the husband of his own mom, as a, as if he had procreated himself. Um, but the original echo that I think it's coming from is it's another version of Ham separated his parents and took his wife, uh, took his mother as his wife. Um, in the Sumerian, Enki separated Ki from An with an axe, and then basically he sires various goddesses with, with Ki. Uh, in Sumerian, another version, Enlil, 
who I think is the same as uh, both Enki and Enlil are ham figures along with Utu. This basically being three titles of ham and you could throw in Shamash, the, the solar deity as well. So Enlil also separates heaven from earth, um, thus making the world habitable for humans. So we have a, a lot of, uh, a number of these ancient pagan sources that are basically agreeing. Um, and let's see. And I've I've gone into this. If you go to my Substack, creationhistory.substack.com, I, I've got a series coming out. Uh, the first two of them are already published, called the um, basically Euhemerism, Euhemerism revisited. And so I go into more detail on these sources. So that's the story then of Ham. But in this story that appears to be emerging out of these various traditions, Noah's wife or Ham's mother seems to play an important role. What exactly is that role and who was Noah's wife? Okay, well, we're gonna argue, I'm gonna make the case here that Naama was the wife of Noah. Naama, who is listed in Genesis chapter four as she's basically this uh, woman from the line of Ham. I think, I think she's the seventh generation. Uh, her father's name is Lamech. He's the one who sang the song about uh, vengeance, how he took vengeance on an old man and a young man, and how if Cain is avenged seven times, Lamech is avenged 77 times. And that, of course, plays into the gospel narrative where Jesus takes that and flips it on its head, say, no, uh, you should forgive 70 times seven. So he's, he's, he's not just um, flipping Lamech's um, vengeance discourse, but he's actually flipping it and multiplying it. It's, no, you have to forgive. So Naama came from that family, but there also is some other evidence. Um, there's a rabbinical tradition, which I consider to be a pretty low quality source called the Book of Jasher. So it's a pseudo, I would call it pseudo Jasher. I'm sure most scholars would agree. It's, but it is a rabbinical tradition. So it's basically so rabbis cobbled together a bunch of rabbinical traditions from the Talmud of what they think the book of Jasher would have said, and they publish it as the book of Jasher. Um, so while it is clearly not the book of Jasher referred to in scripture, it is um, a fair, fairly accurate um, summary of rabbinical tradition on the subjects that it covers. And the book of Jasher says that um, Naama was the, no, sorry, Naama's, the two women that Lamech married, which would include Naama's mother Zillah, as well as her sister Ada, that they were the daughters of Canaan from the line of, uh, of Seth, which, and I think Canaan was several generations before Noah. So that would make Naama, if that's true, that would make Naama like Noah's third or fourth cousin. So that would make her also both from the line of Cain, but also from the line of, of Seth. Um, so we're going to look at nine sources, or at least I'm going to summarize nine sources, look at a couple of them in detail that Naama was the wife of Noah. So the youngest source we have is the Quran, and their tradition is that Naama was the wife of Noah, um, without giving much other detail. Uh, the Talmud also says Naama was the wife of Noah, but the rabbis debated over whether she was the daughter of Lamech or whether she was the daughter of um, someone on the Sethite line. Uh, I mentioned the book of Jasher, which makes her basically the granddaughter of Canaan. Um, or the great granddaughter, yeah, the grand the granddaughter. Uh, Diodorus tells us that it 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 basically cobbles three women together into the myth of Semiramis. So I call them one, two, and three. But it tells how her first husband's name was Onus, which is very close to Oannes, which is the Babylonian one of the Babylonian names of Noah. Um, in the Diodorus account, it's obviously. He knew that was the name of her first husband, but he very obviously made up details of a story of how um, the Ninus figure takes her away from her first husband, which clearly are not historical. Um, in Hesiod, we see Gaia and Aranos, and of course, Hesiod, we don't see her name, Naama, but it's the story of Naama and Noah. Uh, Sanko Niathan also, uh, Guy and Oranos, it's the story of Naama and Noah and the reasons she left him, or at least her reasons that she claimed that she left him. 
If you enjoy this content, please consider supporting this channel as a patron or paid Substack subscriber. I post reflections on scripture six days a week, and three of these posts are exclusive to those who are patrons or paid subscribers on Substack at $5 per month. At $10 per month, patrons have access both to all of my written content as well as to weekly exclusive videos of about a half hour per week. At $30 per month, patrons have access to all of the preceding as well as a weekly class on the Old Testament of about an hour to an hour and a half each. Finally, at $35 per month, patrons receive access to all of my written and recorded exclusive content, as well as the ability to schedule monthly calls of one hour every month, as long as you remain a patron at this level. You can also access these benefits through channel memberships on YouTube. Please also consider purchasing my lecture sets, Answering Protestantism from the Bible, 17 hours, and Answering Calvinism from the Bible, 6.5 hours. These can be purchased either individually or together for a discount. All links are in the description box and pinned comment. Your support, both financially and especially through your daily prayers, is what enables me to produce regular, high-quality, and original content. Thank you so much. So number seven, the Ogdoed, which comes from Egypt. That means the eight, the eight gods. Um, on and on it. Sorry, no, it's new and new Annette or something like that. But effectively, you have Amun as the bull of his own mother or the self-creating that he's, he created himself by marrying his own mother. And so you have the same element of the story there where Ham marries her after she leaves Noah. And number eight, we have Enki and Ninma, which is the second oldest source. It's the Sumerian um, text. And in that text, Enki, which is Ham, separates his parents with an axe. And then he basically becomes the husband of Ki. And it's kind of a creation, how, we, how they created the various plants and things like that. Um, number nine, which is the most literal and the most ancient, is a votive inscription of King Lugal Kesalsi of Uruk to Naamu, uh, sorry, Namu, the wife of An. Now, this is really significant because he is in the second dynasty of Uruk, or at least his father is. And this appears to have been about within two centuries after she died. So we're talking really close to the dawn of history. And he basically built a temple to worship her, but he calls her the wife of An. And An, again, is the name of Noah. And Namu is very, very close to Naama. In fact, some versions translate it Nama instead of Namu. Um, so I'm going to now go just through a couple of these sources in detail. So in the Midrash, the Midrash would obviously be the rabbis from the Middle Ages. Uh, in the same Midrash that mentions the marriage of Naama, the sister of Tubal-Cain, to Noah, the sages also give two seemingly contradictory origins of Naama's name. Some believe the name was given to her because all her deeds were pleasant while others interpret her name, she would beat on a drum to draw people to idol worship. And ironically, both of those things do seem to be related to her actual life, uh, as we will see. Um, but whether they have anything to do with her actual name, I don't know. Um, I might have misspelled this guy's name. Uh, Sanko, Sanko or Sanku Neathon or Nathion. He was the um, Phoenician priest from, he was contemporary with Gideon, and Philo translated his work, um, which Eusebius, I, I guess Porphyry quoted him, and then Eusebius quoted Porphyry. So it, got tr it went through several uh, intermediate stages. But he's basically telling you the story, Aranos being the Noah figure, succeeding to the kingdom of his father, contracted marriage with his sister Gi, the earth, and had by her four sons, Illus, who was called Cronus, who is Ham, Bythalus and Dagon, who which signifies Siton, corn, and Atlas. But by other wives, Oranos had much issue, at which G, being vexed and jealous, reproached Oranos, so they separated from each other. Uh, again, here you see the pagans are adding details to explain in their theology why um, Noah's wife would be angry with him. Now, we looking at this through the lens of Scripture and the uh, the Genesis story, which is uncorrupted, um, Naama's family, meaning her siblings and parents, got destroyed by the flood. So she's angry at him over the loss of her family. 
And then in both the Greek and the Phoenician uh, version of the story, they turn her family into her children so that he somehow buried her children under the ground while the flood obviously buried everybody that it killed in the sediments that it, it laid down. So continuing, but Oranos, though separated from her, still by force came and had intercourse with her whenever he pleased and then went home again. But when he and all, when he also attempted to kill the children he had by her, Gi also often defended or avenged herself, gathering unto her auxiliary powers. So again, um, after the flood, I think they, she basically tried to leave him. Um, where, but where is there to go? <laughs> You're on a mountaintop. You're the only there's now 10 people in your family. You're the only people alive on earth. Um, I think that he and his sons were going out on long trips to explore the world because he felt that he had to map the world. There's also a fairly good chance they were looking for survivors. Maybe she was, she was demanding that they go look and find if her parents or brothers had survived somehow. I mean, you would expect that they would want to know what happened. Um, so he's gone for long periods of time. And when he comes back, he wants to be with his wife and she doesn't want to be with him. And so they record this in the myth as if he is this terrible monster for wanting to be with his wife. Um, so then we have when Cronus, this is the son, the youngest son, when he came to his man's estate by the advice and assistance of Hermes Tri Trimagistus, who was his secretary, he opposed his father, Oranos, avenging his mother. And I'm going to skip forward, but he basically organizes allies. He organizes um, the people with a keen desire to fight against Oranos on behalf of Guy. Uh, and thus Kronos overcoming Oranos in battle drove him from his kingdom and succeeded him in the imperial power. So now we're getting into the Babel rebellion and it's rooted in Ham's rebellion against his father. Um, and so continuing on later in the passage, uh, it gives us the literal uh, humiliation of Noah. In the 32nd year of his power and reign, Illus, who is Cronus, having laid an ambuscade for his father, Oranos, ambuscade means ambush, on a certain place in the middle of the earth, and having gotten him into his hands, cuts off his private parts near fountains and rivers. So there is the Phoenician version of the humiliation of Noah. Um, now, going to the oldest of these sources, I mentioned that... Um, the foundation deposit of Lugal Kisalsi, who is the king of Uruk. This is an actual photograph of it. It was on a ceramic um, nail, which uh, I'm not sure what they use ceramic nails for, but they made them and they put inscriptions on them and they're found in these temple deposits where it was fired clay. So here you have the literal characters and then the translation for Neama, the wife of Anne, Lugal Kisalsi, king of Uruk and king of Ur, the temple of Nama he built. So that's as that's as old as you're gonna find that Naama was the wife of Noah. But wait, when is that that nail? When is it dated to? I mean, what period of history does it come from? Um, the second dynasty of Uruk. So in the conventional chronology, they would tell you that dates to around 3000 BC. Um, in our chronology, I would say that she was uh, th that that king was contemporary with Isaac, so maybe 1850 BC, in the life of Abraham. Right. So for, for viewers, remember that Nimrod is said to have founded a number of cities, one of which is Erech, or I think Uruk is, is the identification of that city. So this is originally, it's as part of Nimrod's world empire. Yep. And she ruled there too. Under, 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 uh, we'll get to that. Yeah. So um, epithets or titles of Namu, they call her the lady who is great and high in the sea. And I think this refers to her as the, she's the mother on board the ark. The ark saved them all through the sea. She's the mother who gave birth to heaven and earth. So um, at the flood was a new creation of the, of the world. And you see this in the pagan pantheons as they take elements from Genesis and then they kind of remold them into their own image to make man and woman the creators of the world. And so they, they turn her into the, the mother goddess, the ancestor. And they also called her the first mother who gave birth to all or senior gods. And again, she's the mother of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The point is, she was the mother of everyone. And so the story is going to get worse and creepier. Her behavior is really bad. Um, 
but her behavior doesn't fall on just one branch of the human race. We're all descended from her. And there's, there's an interesting um, implication of it that I'll get to later. Okay, let's go. Going back to uh, this is a late source. This is Justinus, who I think this is Justinus, um, who has epitomized Pompeius Trogus. And this is where we're connecting uh, Zeus with Cush. So they're calling the uh, a, a woman Rhea, who has two sons, Picus, who they named Zeus, who I believe is Cush, and Ninus, who built a city in Assyria, which is Nineveh. The interesting thing is they make Picus the both the father and the brother of Nimrod in this in Ninus in this. And so he he rebels against Cronus' father and slew him. Well, he obviously didn't actually sl slay him, but this is the story of the the new gods overthrowing the old gods. At Babel, Cush overthrew um, his father Ham, who had in, in, in turn had overthrown his father Noah. And so this is where they're getting all this. It's kind of interesting to me as you describe this story, how it seems to typologically resemble things that we find later in scripture. If you read the uh, uh, the history of the patriarchs in Genesis, you have a series of sons who are rebelling against their father. Absalom does the same thing with King David. The northern kingdom of Israel is racked with um, palace coups and assassinations of the preceding king. Um, and Nama herself, uh, one of the things you find in, in typology is that uh, sometimes a certain image will become, for lack of a better word, intensified later in history um, because typology is a historical reality, not just a literary one. So Eve, in a sense, is a type of Nama, but Eve ultimately repents and is saved. Nama is kind of an Eve who is not so much deceived but actively pursues um, a rebellion. And not just rebellion, uh, a vengeance quest. So you remember Lamech, um, if Cain is avenged seven times, Lamech will be avenged 77 times. Yeah. It appears that she took that to heart and she spent the rest of her life on a vengeance quest to uh, avenge her father. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of driving her actions, which as we see are going to get crazier and crazier. So um, I guess that comes to the next question that you were going to ask me. So uh, this story in some way relates to another somewhat obscure story in scripture, which has been the subject of a lot of discussion in recent years by scholars like Michael Heiser and in the Orthodox world, Father Stephen DeYoung at the Lord of Spirits podcast. And that's the subject of the Nephilim or giants described in Genesis chapter 6. How does this story relate to what we read about in this crisis before the flood? Well, the story has two specific connections to that uh, or implications that affect the, our interpretation of Genesis 6. Um, the two problems we have are there are two interpretations of Genesis 6, one being that it, the sons of God were the line of Seth and the daughters of men were the line of Cain. So it's basically that interpretation says the sin was the sons of Seth, the, the line of Seth married daughters from the line of Cain, and the Nephilim were just bad offspring of those just regular humans who were just were um, ideologically opposed to God. Uh, great, great supervillains or whatever you want to call them. Uh, mighty men against Yahweh. Um, this, the, okay, so the second problem is that that very same passage says, and also afterwards, meaning after the flood, there were Nephilim again. And what we're going to see is, as we look at the life of Naama, the, the historical testimony answers both questions. Um, and it's really creepy. Um, so the first question would be, could this line of Seth marrying the daughters of Cain be true? if Naama was the wife of Noah. Um, because that would mean if God, if the great thing that caused the world to become so corrupt that God had to destroy it was the line of Seth marrying daughters from the line of Cain. But then if Noah is a line of Seth guy married to Naama from the line of Cain on the ark, doesn't that perpetuate the problem you were trying to fix? 
and there's even you know there's more I, I guess the other problem with that is it's projecting back the law of separation given to moses onto the time before the flood when no such law has i mean maybe god had gave them great revelations maybe they had a book of the law of god that had been revealed to adam and seth that simply wasn't preserved for us because it wasn't part of what we needed to know so there could have been more revelation before the flood i'm not ruling that out but that particular angle on that story is applying revelation that was not given until moses you're applying this law of separation to cain well because cain was a murderer well king david was a murderer too and we don't say it was wrong for you know any believer to marry the descendants of king david because jesus was descended from king david and even god deigned to include rahab in the ancestry of christ she's the canaanite the problem with the the canaanite theory and the sethite theory is that they it, it just seems to be generally contradictory and then once you add the historical evidence that Naama was noah's wife that it seems to me like it crumbles apart and i think the real reason for adopting that interpretation was a discomfort with the idea that angels could take human women and have children with them um there's an element of materialism in us that rebels against that you know the modern scientific mind uh, but even philo was a the jewish teacher from alexandria who first you know wrote this down and popularized that view but if you look at what the jews of philo's day did they sanitized they sanitized the old testament and kind of removed all the parts with sex um so i think even then it was uncomfortable and so they they sanitized it and and the whole sethite with the line of cain theory is a way of rationalizing away something that is really disturbing that we'd rather not think about as being part of our history and being true i mean it's fine to have horror stories and alien movies about things from up there coming down here and taking our women and wanting to have offspring that are hybrids that want to kill us and eat us. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's effectively the story. Half the science fiction films that have ever been made, if you want to call it meta narrative, are kind of retelling that story in you know a uh, a science fiction kind of framework. It's uh, and you know it, it's when the Israelite encounter the Nephilim in the land in Numbers thirteen. They use a very interesting phrase. They say this is a land which devours its inhabitants. And it's one of the most ubiquitous things that you find from traditions about giants from around the world, including, you know, Native American tribes, that they're people eaters. And they often have six fingers as well, which is an interesting detail that you mm -hmm. find in the story of Goliath. And I think that goes back to this archetypal quality that the enemy himself has in Genesis 3, where it's said to him, you shall eat dust. Well, dust is what people return to when they die. This idea mm -hmm. of eating the dead and eating people is a quality yeah. which associates the serpent with these giant figures, both in scripture and in traditions from around the world. Um, for interested viewers, I have a series of articles on, on my Substack where I'm developing a, a thesis about the mode in which the Nephilim were produced. But it's, it's, um, it's certainly true that in the early Christian period, um, uh, most uh, interpreters seem to have taken this to refer to the union of heavenly beings and uh, uh, human women. Yeah, and that might make for a good follow-on episode because I have, I guess, a lot more things I could talk about. The Nephilim, just as a thing, like if you ask me about polyploidy when this is over or at, when I get to the end of my slides, because I think polyploidy ties into the six fingers. Um, but mainly our point here is to look at the historical references to it uh, as opposed to the theoretical theological possibilities um so in the story of niyama uh, we find that she gets deified as these various goddesses such as ishtar and semiramis who's just a queen not a goddess but um she's called isis who is just a she, i guess she was later worshipped as a goddess in egypt and then later deified into hathor so i guess a goddess got turned into a higher goddess <laughs> Um, but the story of Isis and Osiris, as well as the story of Gilgamesh, uh, um, they both directly imply that this is how the Nephilim came back after the flood, that Gilgamesh was the first of the post-flood Nephilim, and we're told how it happened. 
Um, the, this depiction I have in the slide is it's from the it's the tomb of Osiris. Of course, there's a, several places that claim to be that in Egypt, or it's a depiction of Osiris after he's dead. And in their myth, Isis, his wife, who I believe is Naama, Osiris is Nimrod. Nimrod gets killed by his enemies. It takes her years to get the find all the pieces of his body and reassemble him. And then she impregnates herself to become the mother of his reincarnated spirit. And this picture of the uh, this falcon, I think it's a falcon, could be a dove. But that is her as Isis um, hovering over the body of Isis, receiving his seed to have this reincarnated child who in the Egyptian, um, they call him Horus the Younger. But his actual name as a king in Egypt was Den. He's Den. Uh, Merneith is her name as the queen. Um, and Gilgamesh is Narmer. Um, that's also another longer story. But lest that seem to me to be me reading too much into just this one picture, um, in the Gilgamesh epic, it, it's much more explicit. So in the Sumerian king list, it calls him Gilgamesh, whose father was an invisible being, Lord of Kulaba. The Akkadian version of this says his father was a Lilu, which means a demon. Um, and then we see the strange thing about Gilgamesh as you're reading the Epic of Gilgamesh. In the story, he's claiming Prima Nocta in this town of Uruk, the city of Uruk that he rules as king. And I'll read it to you. Gilgamesh the king is about to celebrate marriage with the queen of love. And he still demands to be first with the bride, the king to be first, and the husband to follow. For that was ordained by the gods from his birth, from the time the umbilical cord was cut. But now the drums roll for the choice of the bride, and the city groans. So the story they're telling is that he's this king of the city, and he's claiming the right that whenever someone gets married in that city, he gets to sleep with the bride on the wedding night, before, and then he gives her to the husband after he's... He's, he's slept with her. Um, and that's called Prima Nocta. And we probably know about that from the, the film Braveheart, where I don't know why they put that in there because there's no evidence the English ever did such a thing. But Gilgamesh definitely did such a thing. And what's interesting is this passage where it says, it was ordained by the gods from his birth from the time the umbilical cord was cut. As if some kind of an oath was made when he was either conceived or born that this is what he would have to do and it if you take the story of isis and Os osiris and um, horus and you look at gilgamesh is telling the same story um it looks like she basically made a deal with the devil because her she had been trying to maybe bring back the line of cain she viewed nimrod as her you know, he's her son but he's her lover he's her he has He's, he's helping her to avenge uh, her father by fighting against Yahweh, which is why it says Gilgamesh is mighty against Yahweh. Uh, but now he's dead and her hopes are gone and she's probably also past the age of childbearing. So it would take some kind of a, I mean, we've had cases now of women who are past menopause can be given hormones and have given birth to children through uh, artificial insemination. So we know it's technologically possible. And I've, and basically saying the story they're telling us is she made some kind of a pact with the devil. Maybe she didn't know it was the devil. Maybe she thought it, she was talking to her ancestor because I think demons appear to people impersonating their ancestors. And that's how they get people to worship their ancestors, but they're actually worshiping the demons. So she makes kind of some kind of a covenant and the covenant includes, you're going to have this child and this child is going to, you're going to, he's going to have the right to claim all the women. Well, of course, if you view the Nephilim as what they are, it's Satan creating a counterfeit incarnation in the human race. He's trying to replace us. Not He wants to replace the godly seed of the woman that God has promised with the seed of the serpent. And maybe genetically engineered. Um, who knows what they're capable of doing or were capable of doing. But if you look at the story of the Nephilim, they're basically, they were designed as tanks. They're bigger they're bigger, they're stronger, they're hungrier, and they are basically known for two things. They eat people, and they take our women and have their kids with them. And that's the story of half the alien movies ever made. So uh, continuing uh, back to the historical sources, 
So the same Midrash that mentions the marriage of Niyama, the sister of Tubal-Cain, we read that earlier. I'm going to skip down to the part I didn't read you before. Another Midrash states that Niyama was so beautiful that she was responsible for the incident mentioned in Genesis 6. The sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they choose, chose. In other words, claims the Midrash, Naama was one of the daughters of humans that caused angels to descend to earth and to fornicate with them. And I believe, if we believe that the historical myth of Isis and the myth of Gilgamesh, it's true. But it's in a different context than these rabbis who recorded this. They're assuming she did this in Genesis 6, before the flood. But the historical record is suggesting, no, she did this after the flood, after she rebelled against Noah, after her rebellion had failed when Nimrod got killed, and this she and she finally resorts to this. And you you can kind of see her character arc as a, an evil supervillain. Evil evil supervillains are never born as supervillains. They start as a nice person and they have some kind of an event in their life that transforms them to have this chip on their shoulders that turns them into a supervillain. And in her case, it's the death of her family that transforms her into this bitter woman who wants revenge. And after her own best plans for revenge fail, she finally resorts to the one thing that you would think she would never have gone to because we're led to believe that you know this Genesis 6, um, these mighty men, are they are persecuting the, the saints. Um, there's... There's violence and bloodshed that the earth is full of. There's a reason Noah didn't get married until he was 500. It means there was a scarcity of godly women for him to marry, which could be because they're being taken. They're being taken by these beings um, who are taking them. So you would think that she, being married into that family, would view them as the bad guys, and that would be the last thing she would want to see is to bring them back. Um, and I don't know if the rules changed after the flood. You know, there are implications in scripture that demons and fallen angels, there's certain rules where they're allowed to do so much, but not, but not no more. Right. And maybe before the flood, they were not limited. And so they were and it specifies in Genesis, they're taking anyone whom they chose implying lack of consent. But after the flood, it may be that they are limited to women who have in some way consented by granting satanic authority into their lives. Um, which, you know, witchcraft, there's a lot of different ways that people grant demonic authority that that might, that that might be viewed as a, a, a form of consent. Um, but the point is, there's a story being told here where she, she's the one who marries Noah, they're delivered from, the, the flood delivers them from the evil of the, the violence of the Nephilim and these mighty men from before the flood. And yet, in her vengeance quest, she finally becomes the one who turns back and consents to bring that force back into the world. And that's the story that's being told here. Uh, or at least that sure is what it looks like to me. So the end of Na Naoma's character arc is also very appropriate for a supervillain. We have three versions of the story. Um, the Assyrian version is found in Diodorus. It's, it comes from Tessius. Uh, it calls her Semiramis. It calls Nimrod Ninus. So it says that they, that Ninus gets killed. Semiramis rules and she raises this son named Ninus Zamis. And I believe that the Zamis comes from Gilgam, the second part of Gilgamesh's name, Gamesh and Zemesh. So it's this it's a reference to Gilgamesh. And it says um, she conceived a criminal passion for her son, meaning she wanted to marry him. And so instead he killed her. Your your in your construction. Uh, Ninus, who we can identify as Nimrod because he's said to build some of the same cities that Nimrod builds. His, he is the father of Gilgamesh. That's in the uh, Assyrian version, yes. Okay. So some some of them say he was the father. Others say that um, a demon was the father or an invisible person or Osiris was the father. But others say that he's the reincarnation of Osiris. So if Gilgamesh is the reincarnation of Nimrod, is Nimrod the father, or is, is Gilgamesh the new Nimrod? I don't, you know, I think they kind of mash it all together. I'm just relating, we have three versions of the story, and they differ on certain details, but they agree on certain de details. So in the Epic of Gilgamesh, it doesn't tell you that Ishtar is his mother. Ishtar being 
another version of Nayama. Um, but he goes up to the mountain. He kills the priest of Yahweh, which I believe is Huawa in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, he's, he goes up to the mountain where the Ark had landed. He kills somebody there, most likely the priest of Yahweh. He comes back and he tells everyone, I killed Yahweh. Gilgamesh was mighty against Huawa, uh, using the same form of the phrase as you see in Genesis, speaking of Nimrod. So he is he's proving he's the second Nimrod by act by doing what Nimrod did, but doing it by even raising the stakes and doing it higher and better, right? She proposes marriage to him. She's so happy. Ishtar is so happy she wants to marry him. And but when she wants to marry him, he then proceeds to tell her all the reasons, all the men that she burned. <laughs> <laughs> and she says she complains to her father who they make on as Anu instead of her first husband but she complains to Anu and says Gilgamesh has told me all of my horrible deeds give me the bull of heaven weapon so that I can punish him you know, so she's just deeply offended that he dared to tell her her horrible deeds so she sends this weapon against him called the bull of heaven which is another side trail i don't want to get onto right now of what that was but instead of having in this story instead of killing her he kills the bull of heaven a divine being sent by her so in a sense the bull of heaven is a substitute for her because it wouldn't do in sumerian theology for uh, gilgamesh to kill ishtar because that's their top goddess now in the egyptian version uh, isis is the mother of horus and osiris had been killed so Horus is the reincarnation of Osiris, who's somehow the seed of Osiris and also the reincarnation of Osiris. And in in this story, he uh, sorry she shows mercy to Set, who's the enemy of Horus, who I think refers to those who followed the patriarch Seth, which it means there was a remnant amongst the line of Ham in Egypt who were following the patriarchal religion, and they were resistant to the uh, corrupt agenda of Nimrod and then later Gilgamesh. So he's he's fighting against them for kingship of Egypt. And in some ways she shows mercy to them by not killing them. So he chops her head off. And then he uh I think it's and then then Thoth comes along and gives her the head of a cow and she turns into Hathor. But what the of course it's a ridiculous silly myth, but the three versions of the story are preserving the same information and what we end up with is we find that there's two witnesses to each of the elements so there's two two witnesses that he he that she asked to marry him the assyrian and the epic of gilgamesh both say that there's two witnesses that he killed her which would be the assyrian and the egyptian um and so i think between the three we have what looks to me to be three witnesses to the same story so and let's so let's move past the witnesses and, and think about what that means. So her character arc is she's born into this family. She's taught vengeance by her father, but maybe, you know, maybe other than that, he wasn't that bad. You know, um, his family are still kind of on the good guy side, right? Close enough that Noah, maybe Noah was buying parts for the ark from, um, from Tubal King cause he needed metal, you know, fasteners, who knows, right? So he meets Niyama and maybe she, as a child, as a young woman, she was um, compassionate and she loved animals and she liked Noah and respected him. And, you know, she's she's the good person that the supervillain always is when they start as a young person. They seem like a good person. They seem to have the right values. They profess faith. They, they um, give a false profession of faith, you might call it. But then the event comes that they apostatize. And so for her, the event, the flood happens, her family is killed. The trauma of her family being killed brings out this darkness in her heart. And she turns against the God who sent the flood. She turns against her husband and she goes on this vengeance quest. And the vengeance quest first leads her to turn her son Ham against his father. And granted, Ham is responsible for his behavior he was an adult when this happened he wasn't a kid but there's also an element where he is the child and she is the mother and so if you want to look for the root of this evil she is the one who ultimately she bore the responsibility of leading her son to do evil but he also has responsibility just like adam in the garden of eden who listened to the voice of his wife 
Ham listened to the voice of his mother to do an evil thing. And he, he said, okay, I'll do it. And then married his mother. Um, so that's the next stage in her character arc. And then she continues the character arc where she ends up leaving Ham for Nimrod, uh, you know, gener uh, basically a hundred years later after the dispersion is when she marries Nimrod. Ham's still out there somewhere. Um, so she becomes the wife of Nimrod and together they're conquering the world. And, and now her rebellion reaches another stage because as the wife of Nimrod in Egypt, as Neith Hotep or uh, Isis as she's called, she, it says she creates temples all over the world to worship Nimrod uh, after he gets killed. So now she's gone from being a victim or at least a perceived victim in her own mind um, to being an adulteress, but now she's becoming a priestess. She's actually going beyond just a, being a sinner, but actually being a, a teacher and a, um, a founding instructor in the religion of a, what's effectively witchcraft, uh, because ultimately all rebellion against the true God is witchcraft. But in her case, it literally becomes witchcraft. So then Nimrod gets killed. And now you see her character come out once again. She, she faces this yet another crisis. And this time she turns to the, the dark powers, the witchcraft, the devil, whatever it is that she does. She basically makes a deal. And this child Gilgamesh comes from this, who is basically uh, conceived by a demon in some way or other. At least that's that's the story that we're, we're told by the mythology. So was it really? It's hard to say, but it, it it is consistent with the story that we're told in Genesis. So she brings this demon child into the world. She trains him to hate Yahweh. He goes to the mountain and commits vengeance against Yahweh. He does whatever he does to desecrate the site. He kills the priests. He comes back, proclaims, I defeated Yahweh. I killed, I killed Huawa. And now she wants to marry him. You would think her vengeance is now complete, but then he kills her. So she ends up being killed by the monster she created. She ends up falling into the pit that she dug for Noah and Yahweh. And she died within, uh, I think, four years after the death of Noah, according to the, the, Usher, the Usher chronology. He dies in 1998 BC, and she dies in 1994 BC. So that's quite a story. And I think it'd be fascinating to tell the story as a novel or as a film. Um, but for right now, it's just an exploration. And uh, as you once said in a previous episode, the deep weird or the dark weird. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, it, it's when you describe that story again, it just resonates with all these little typological accents you see in scripture. One of the great themes in scripture is the king. He goes, he defeats the enemy and he wins for himself a bride. That's the story of Christ. He defeats the dragon and he wins the church of the bride. The, in the book of Judges, Othniel uh, uh, has a victory and he wins a bride in a spring of water. Uh, well, here we see Gilgamesh is kind of inverting all of this. He goes and he claims to defeat not the enemy, but the true God. And instead of coming back and winning the good bride, he wins the rights, as it were, as it were to Nama, and he kills her instead. And so you know, it's one of those things that I think, at least for me, has really become a kind of it gives me a, a sign or a ring of authenticity to a story when it resonates typologically with all of these other things in scripture, because this is the way that the world uh, really works. Um, so can you want to wrap up and uh, just draw out the implication of all of this, all, all of these um, theses? Yes. Gilgamesh may have been the greatest anti-hero to ever live, right? Uh, he would be as close to the Antichrist, I think, as you could possibly get. Um, so the implications, I think, that come from this, if we accept, you know, what, what do we have, eight or nine witnesses, that Naama was Noah's wife, that means that Genesis 6 has to be referring to angelic beings, not the line of Seth. And that would mean that all flesh on earth today is descended from Cain through Naama, all right? And this is a big deal because 
a lot of the, I guess, racialist doctrines have kind of been based on Ham. Ham was this bad guy and he got this curse on him. And so the Hamitic races are cursed. That's not actually what Genesis says. It was actually Canaan that was cursed. But there, there is a, um, a minor storyline in scripture about the fall of Ham's line, but also the redemption of Ham's line. And there, in the Bible, the line of Ham is redeemed in the end. And so Ham's falling away is not a permanent thing. And if we look at the implication that, that Naama was the mother of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, which means we are all descended from Naama and we're all descended from Cain through the mother's line, that, that says that Christ's work is qualitatively complete. The devil can't say, well, at least I, I got these guys. I got that branch of humanity and um, God couldn't save any of them. But no, God even, it, it pleases God to be a God who saves even the children of his enemies so that the devil doesn't have anything that he can proclaim, that he, he won, that Christ's victory will be complete. So um, I think it's important that it, it refutes racialist doctrines. Um, However, you still have this issue that you have these beings that are descended from these angelic beings that look like men, but they're not men. So you, you cannot get away from the problem of the story still says you still have this line of not humans that look like humans who are evil. And I think, I think it was they would be very obvious should you encounter them. There's a human there's a human nature problem where we want to dehumanize our enemies. But what we really shouldn't do that to our fellow humans is that we we are all children of Adam and Eve. We're all children of Noah and Naama. And Christ came to save us. Christ came to save people from every race. And though people turn away from God and people and nations turn away from God. They can be saved and they will be saved. At least I believe they will. I believe that God and the Holy Spirit will save people from every nation and tongue under heaven. So another issue is that um, we have a lot of men that have been suffering. And I think there's hope in the story that you're not the first to go through this. No, Noah went through this. Noah was a martyr in that way. And yet Noah continued with his mission. He did not let that stop him from his mission to uh, divide the world among his sons, to teach his sons um, and descendants the way of Yahweh, and to continue um, taking efforts to preserve the faith, knowing that even though uh, Cush and Nimrod had rebelled and led everyone after them, almost every, the whole world went after them, you know, and um, went to Babel. But I think Noah had faith and he just kept doing his job all the way until the end. And in the end, um, that faith bore fruit. And it, it was interesting that two years after Noah died, Abraham is born. And Abraham ends up being the, you know, the next generation. He was as much of a prophet to his generation as Noah was to his. And Abraham, through his interactions in Egypt and with Abimelech, in both cases, it's kind of weird. Why does the Bible include the story of, he says, my wife is my sister? It's because this was happening a generation or two after Gilgamesh had died. And Gilgamesh had set the standard that all the all the kings of the Near East were following this. Hey, it's the king's right to take all the women he wants, including the married ones. And whether they kill, your hus you know, kill her husband or just take her away. Abraham's walking into that. Got, and unbeknownst to him, he's the bait in God's mousetrap. God set the mousetrap for Pharaoh. God set the mousetrap for Abimelech because God used both of those circumstances to terrify those kings. Uh, Pharaoh takes Sarah into his harem, but before he can touch her, God curses the household with a plague. Um, closes, you know, he says it closed the wombs of the women and the animals. Somehow the whole, the whole household and the wise men knew something huge has happened. And then God appears to Pharaoh and basically releases Sarah and gives gifts to Abraham. Well, in Egypt, right around this time, you see this major change in the religion to emphasize Re, the God, the, the God of light and the God, God of justice, Mat, M-A-A-T is what they call justice in Egyptian. And so Abraham goes back to Canaan. The same thing happens in Canaan with Abimelech. He takes 
Sarah into his harem. God appears to him and says, you're a dead man. And then we see a generation later with Isaac and Rebecca, Abimelech, I think it's the same Abimelech. I think he's still, he was a very long lived old man. He sees Isaac doing the same thing, but he's learned the lesson. So it doesn't say that Abimelech took Rebecca into his harem. He spots him. He's and he realized what was going on, and then he rebukes Isaac for saying she's his sister because he's now a man who follows the law because God scared him to death when he had that encounter with Abraham and Abraham's wife. So that would be my conclusion is that God used Abraham to defeat and reverse the the influence of Gilgamesh on the kings of the Near East. Um, and I, I guess that concludes what I've got to say for today. Well, thank you so much, Ken. Uh, it's been great having you on uh, as always. We hope to have you on again in the future to talk more about uh, your revision of ancient history. We still have some things that are uh, in the works. Um, so thank you all for watching and hope to see you again soon. If you enjoy this content, please consider supporting this channel as a patron or paid Substack subscriber. I post reflections on scripture six days a week, and three of these posts are exclusive to those who are patrons or paid subscribers on Substack at $5 per month. At $10 per month, patrons have access both to all of my written content as well as to weekly exclusive videos of about a half hour per week. At $30 per month, patrons have access to all of the preceding as well as a weekly class on the Old Testament of about an hour to an hour and a half each. Finally, at $35 per month, patrons receive access to all of my written and recorded exclusive content as well as the ability to schedule monthly calls of one hour every month as long as you remain a patron at this level. You can also access these benefits through channel memberships on YouTube. Please also consider purchasing my lecture sets, Answering Protestantism from the Bible, 17 hours, and Answering Calvinism from the Bible, 6.5 hours. These can be purchased either individually or together for a discount. All links are in the description box and pinned comment. Your support, both financially and especially through your daily prayers, is what enables me to produce regular, high-quality, and original content. Thank you so much.